Welcome to On Security. Conversations with the world's leading security technologists. Brought to you by Well, I, I've written uh, a bunch of books. I wrote in 1996, Java Security and Securing Java. That got me started thinking about software security. Right. Then I wrote Building Secure Software in 2001. And that really kicked off this whole field of software security or application security, the idea of building security into things. I wrote a book called Exploiting Software in 2004 with Greg Hogland. And that book was about how software breaks and real attacks, very hardcore book. The reason that we wrote that was these vendors were selling pretend solutions. You know, they, they were like, we can test for buffer overflows with this really dumb test. And we're like, well, actually, let me show you what a buffer overflow really looks like. This is what you're up against, so. You know who says it best? Um, Bruce Schneier is very pithy, and one of his, his great ones is, it's kind of like sticking a post in the in the ground in front of your house and hoping that all the criminals run right into the post. Bam! You know. <laughs> so it's a pretty good analogy. And then I wrote a book called um, Software Security, Building Security In. That was released in February of last year. And that book is about how to do software security right. It's really meant for people that are serious about their large enterprise of tens of thousands of developers. How do I get these guys like a bank? How do I get all these guys to do software security and what does that mean? There is, re there is resistance. There, there are kind of two threads there. The first is, so I've been breaking systems for about 10 years. And there's a surprising thing that happens when you break somebody's system. You go to them and you say, hey, we broke your system. And they look at you and they go, well, you know. You're not supposed to do that. That's not allowed. The thing you put in, nobody would do that, and you're not supposed to do that. They get all upset about it. You say, guys, you know, we're the bad guys. There are no rules. We bro we're sorry we broke your system, but let's make it so we can't break your system that way anymore. And I think it's this kind of this optimistic view of no one would ever do that, or surely they wouldn't do that to my code that needs to be overcome. Books like Exploiting Software help to get people over that fact. So that's one thing that you can use to help overcome any sort of barrier to software security. Another thing that you can do is show them that you're actually a software guy. You know, I started life as a software guy. I have a PhD in computer science and cognitive science from Indiana. I wrote 25,000 lines of scheme for my thesis. You know, I've written, I've been involved in lots and lots of software projects. So. As a software guy, I can go and I can say, hey, I know you guys are skeptical of those security idiots because most of them are idiots. You know, you get on their side that way. You say, see this scar? This is the scar I got in 1996 when I was working on this and that system. And they go, oh, right, right, right. So you sort of do the alpha geek maneuver and, and you show them that you're a software person and they come around. And I think that, you know, there's a good thing about most developers. They want to build stuff that gets used and that works. And if you say, this is the right way to do it, and they believe you, they'll try like crazy to do it that way because they want to build good stuff. They don't want to make a big mess. They just don't know right now what they need to do. I'm hugely optimistic about the progress we made. You know, I wrote this book, Building Secure Software, in 2000, and around that time, you couldn't sell software security to my mom, right? So... People were like, security, yes, software, yes, software security, what the heck are you talking about? So now, go out here to RSA, to the show floor, you're going to find, you know, half the people talking about vulnerabilities and exploits and software, software, software. That is a huge change in seven years. And I think we've made a lot of progress in identifying the problem. Now we can say software security, and people don't go, what's that? They go, ooh, yeah, I need to do some of that. How do you do that again, they say? That's where they need to get my book, Software Security, learn how to do it, 
We're changing these huge organizations to do this stuff right. And we got plenty of work to do. We're not done. But the problem now, we don't have to explain anymore. We can say, software is broken. Everybody goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about how to make it so it's not broken. I mean, you can say Microsoft just came out with Vista. They clearly care a lot more about security than they used to because they were starting to get this reputation as a virus bag. <laughs> you know, instead of builds cool stuff, virus bag? They didn't, that's not what they wanted to be known as. Microsoft equals virus bag. So they spent a lot of money trying to train their developers. Um, there's a guy, Mike Howard, who's written books on software security. He and I really are the leaders in that field. And he's tried to get Microsoft to adopt these best practices in their software development life cycle. They've made some good forward progress there. However, they have a huge installed base. And they have a huge amount of sort of inertia and momentum in this current direction of, you know, what Microsoft software is like. So they have to make things more secure without making them so secure that people just complain and moan about these obscure dialogues that pop up. And sure enough, you look at the Vista stuff and people are complaining about the security stuff, especially little tiny manufacturers. You know, they want their game to work and you have to become administrator to install it and blah, 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 blah. The problem with security is you don't get it for free. And anybody who says you can get it for free is just making stuff up. It's trade-off. It can be a pain. You got to hit that trade off right down the middle so that people are secure enough and that you can get stuff done at the same time. And that's the big trick of security, software or otherwise. But then if you say, you know, set it between zero and five, they're like, what? what's zero? What's five? You know, the, the, these are all kind of tricky user interface questions, really. But the, I think ultimately one of the big problems is people aren't really sure what security is or how much they need. One of the things that we've purposefully done, we being the computer security research community over the last 10 years, starting really right around 96, 97 when we were breaking Java a lot, is to show that these systems that we rely on do in fact have really serious problems and we need to work on them. So every once in a while, there'll be a spectacular story about how some system is just woefully inadequate. For example, electronic voting machines, clearly just a disaster from a security perspective. Or those RFID chips in your speed pass, clearly a disaster from a security pers perspective. Or the way SMS works on your cell phone. Turns out you can take the entire cell network down with a laptop and a gigabit line. You know, <laughs> with just having your PC send messages on the SMS thing will bring control right down. That's a security disaster. So all of these security problems, if we put them out in front of people and say, hey, we need to do a better job with computer security. We're working hard on this problem, but it's not about throwing firewalls at it. It's not about intrusion detection systems. It's not about policing. It's about architecture. And we changed the security paradigm from this reactive stance to a much more proactive, let's build security in, let's give people the choices that they, can, that they need to, to decide their own security level. Let's do those things um, from the beginning. That's already happening, and, and, uh, and I'm optimistic that that's the right way to do it. I mean, clearly the reactive approach hasn't worked over the last 20 years, so we got to do something else. For more information, visit onpodcastweekly.com and subscribe to all our podcasts. Brought to you by the publishing imprints and information portal of Pearson Education.